see how that's hollowed out like a drum or oh, a notch in a uh, a notch here that where the or I'll tie the stomach on there I could even grab that stomach and show it to you the stomach that I covered these actually came from the drum that wore out yeah I, I can actually show you instead of trying to describe it you'll even see how uh, how I got them cut out that chunk of ivory that I was cutting from but yeah see this was uh, my old drum cover it even still has the lashing that has I actually go and use the walrus stomach and I have to cover them. Well, I'm Stanley Taku, born and raised here in Chishmara. I was born 1961, July 24, 1961, so, you know, been in this community for Almost 60 years, so I'll be 60 about a week and a half, so. My name is uh, Travis Taku. I'm from Brevik Mission, but I lived here in Chishma for three years. I was born in 1990. Long Atika In other words, my Eskimo name is Stanley. Uh, I was named after somebody that passed on my elder from Deering side, so. I took a cord up, so my name is Stanley. I can't introduce myself fluently, but my name is Keguk. It's a uh, name given from here in Shishmaraf, actually. Well, this island, according from the elders, when they do carbon dating of our art, ancestors' artifacts, this island is about 4,000 years old. But the main thing they made camp here is easy access to the marine mammals that we depend on, like the bearded seal and the walrus. And the fish and the bears are real close to the river, so. Basically, a lot of resources that go throughout the whole year that are here through spring, summer, fall, and winter. This was one of the main trading sites that were along the coast of Alaska and Russia. Church was built in the school. They had no choice but to come here and you know, start this community. So. Yeah, because there's a school here. Everybody that li lived were relied on down the coast or up the coast. They come, even my, my dad is from Brevig. He was born there, but uh, he went to school here in the 70s. That's because there was opportunity to for the school system. So this, this, this site, this village has a lot of history behind it and it probably will have a lot of history to come. We don't have no fast food here or anything close by we could just go Taco hop, Bell or hop, hop on the car and go you have a bite to eat, you gotta go out there, access it yourself. Prepare it, put it away. And it's a rich, it's rich here. There's you can't go hungry unless if you don't like to work for your food. Always have something to harvest and always have something to do throughout the year, even though if it's blowing 40 below or if it's 40 above. All four seasons, spring, summer, fall, winter, there are different ways of preserving food, different ways of hunting these sea mammals or land mammals. So we sustain ourselves by just like the gathering, weather hunting gathering all four seasons as the season so. change the techniques change right huh? as the season change yeah. the techniques change yeah so. the the flavor of the animal changes if you're going to respect the animal you're go when you go to harvest it you will you will use only what you need and if you continue using only what you need, it'll always return, just like the sun. 
the sun sets, but it will always rise again. When when we go out and harvest this, the ogruk, we go and harvest the caribou, the walrus, we work together. And that to doing together is what why we are still here. This is how we were taught for thousands of years, so everything is shared. Walrus take care of one another just as we do. Just like us, you know, like I say, we had a lot of respect for Mother Nature, land and sea. Without them, we wouldn't be here. Or... Getting to it actually is the main, the main part of the process yeah. because if we can't access the walrus, there's no way we can process it. And with weather, the weather changing, the ice is not as strong as it has been before. It takes a lot of gas to go and get that, go and harvest the animals we harvest. We, we can't just go right up to the river. We have to take time and energy to get to the animal, which, which is why we respect the animal so much, because that's the energy that we're taking. So I'm real glad and happy that uh, when we're at the racks, we got youngsters that just, you know, 12, 10, 12 years old, helping, helping at the rack, doing hands-on things, helping their grandmas, helping their parents, and even preparing if, these foods. If they're not helping and they're so young, they'll be standing there and say, how come you're, what you doing, why? Watching and learning. Yeah, that. So. My first memory of ivory carving was uh, my grandpa Harry Kokiak working on, it wasn't ivory too much, these were mostly uh, mastered on making like small little jewelry with a, with a bow, bow drill, hickory with a nail sharpened and a mouthpiece and drilling. That, that was their demo tool. Carving harpoon tips using the same technique. The thing is that what gets me wondering is how did our ancestors thousands of years ago cut ivory perfectly straight in half without any kind of hand saw or yeah, I know they had to use probably jade. And without leaving a saw marks. Like. And without leaving saw marks, but some of the cuts are thin. How, how did they do it? And these are fossilized ivory. My first memory with ivory carving <coughs> was with my Uncle Teddy. He was originally from King Island, but he married to my auntie, and he was also a known carver. So well, that's your Uncle Teddy Pollock? Teddy yeah, Pollock, he he, yeah, here. he married my auntie, so he... I would be visiting aunties or uncles, and I came across my uncle, and. There was nobody in the living room, so I go in the bathroom, and there he is sitting in a small wooden bench with a chunk of ivory in his hand, and I asked, asked what was going on, and he explained to me that he was making a polar bear. So I sat there, and I w continued watching, and I said, man, I want to do that one day. <laughs> the smell that my uncle, that came from my uncle's carving room, that was unique. That was the first time I ever had that smell and that was even that was exciting because yeah. the sounds the noise that was going on that I was the curious sound. yeah I was curious to what was going on so I sat there and after after so many days going by my uncle started at telling me that it's pop quiz day because I would ask 21 questions how come you're cutting that what are you gonna do with it why where are you get it from is it hard to do you know I had all these questions that came to my mind and of course I wanted answers so I would come and I would go and question even though I had already asked the question I would ask it in a different the same sentence but different wording and so yeah that was that was my first experience with ivory carving watching my uncle what inspires me for carving is the uh, joy, the time and the joy that's put into it. 
because when I go to show a piece and I see that somebody is amazed by it, that, that makes me want to make more and even better myself at what I do. And uh, if, it, if it's for the purpose of tools and I go and make, make such tools and it does the job right and I run into the person that bought it or used it and they tell me that they were successful because of the tools and that's, that's I guess that's what inspires me to get better. I'm glad to be an Inupiaq, indigenous, and respect our tradition, culture, and our values, our ancestors for thousands of years, and still continue to learn. That's how that, that's what this is for. It started off as this, and it's made, I round it off, shape it off into ivory beads. But yeah, there's a, uh, a whole bunch of different projects that I have, I had started, but I... And basically what's gonna happen is, we'll see where the Ugruk sunk, where the water sunk. It'll leave a, a bubble line or a blood line where you'll see okra, uh, blood, oil. What would happen is we'll throw this just past the Ugruk and it'll sink to the bottom and we'll drag it on the bottom and we'll fill it on the Ugruk and we'll give it a sturdy tug and that'll snag right into the Ugruk or walrus, whichever whichever will we were pursuing but yeah there's this also what we will what we really rely on on the hunt these little things help determine whether or not your trip was successful well when I was growing up here we had big sand dunes on the north side of the island, big old beach, and the ocean were part of ways out. We had to haul water from these lakes for drinking water because we had no wash here and, and thought all these lakes were fresh. They were fresh water. There was a um, hunting beluga. I think we used to have an old beluga pod here at one time. But when we get the generator and high frequency radio, they all disappeared, so. I kind of miss those, you know, but we have life, I guess, but um, Kishma is eroding very fast pace. This island is like maybe just a quarter mile wide by three miles. The main thing is... Environment. Environment. I would move to my spring camp and live off there, you know, like our ancestors did, follow the season. Come, winter come, come back here. I don't know, we just gotta figure out something. With a job you put in time, you put in effort. It's the same with ivory. When, you, when, when he gets a chunk of ivory, he has to go and clean it, prepare it for whichever project he might have on his mind. A lot of people rely on ivory on the, both coasts of Alaska and Russia. It's a material that's very versatile, just like how your camera is versatile. It's, it's, it's like a tool to it helps us get by, the, get by through the life that we live. The jobs are very limited here with ivory that gives up opportunity for income. You give, you give a gift, gift a cousin a chunk of ivory, they'll have something to fall back onto. That would be like how Shishmaraf is eroding. If they were to ban the ivory, that would be like taking a piece of our community, our people. That's like, that's like telling the school, hey, you can't have a principal. But there's no funds to have the principal there. You, you got to lose all your teachers. That 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 would be like that would be really devastating. If there's an ivory ban, that means that there will be restrictions towards hunting, and that would be that would be like taking our rights away. What are we gonna eat? How are we gonna live? How you know? I, I tell you. I don't see. Uh... We we eat uh, Western style food. Go hunting. We, we get cold, we get hungry quick. 
and then versus you eat our native food, boil seal oil, dry meat, you go out there in the cold and oh, you're nice and warm and you cool have all, all day. The, the there cold too. won't bother you. And then you could even, 50 below, you could even be out there having frozen fish without shivering. But Western food, you'll get cold and you know, the energy is not there. Pump. There's just no energy. Lots of changes. We're still eating the same native food that we were raised upon from our ancestors, you know. We respect um, Mother Nature, land and sea, our tradition values and our culture. So I'm glad it's still within our community and our youngsters that we taught. We try to do hands-on things with them because, you know, our language and our things are not written in books, so it's all from memory, stories, and how we were raised. <laughs>